leading expert in the metaphysical and paranormal fields with over 60 books to her credit. She has written nine single volume encyclopedias and reference works, and her current work focuses on interdimensional entity contact experiences, afterlife and spirit communications, extraterrestrial contact with aliens and non-human intelligent beings. Uh, Rosemary is currently a board member of the Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters, and she is a perennial speaker at the Mothman Festival here. Um, please join me in welcoming Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Joe is my husband, so he has to say nice things about me. <laughs> uh, before I begin, just want to point out, I have a radio show now on KGRA Digital Broadcast Network every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Uh, I interview people in the paranormal, cryptozoology, and ufology, and metaphysics. So uh, please join me. The show is archived on KGRA radio as well. All right, my topic today, got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, who is Mothman? Now, I have been researching Mothman for a good number of years, along with other kinds of mysterious creatures and phenomena. I'm involved in ufology, alien contact, ET abductions. Uh, I work in metaphysics, and I work in the paranormal as an investigator. And I look at both the light side and the dark side, because a lot of my cases are uh, very dark about spirit attachments and possessions, entities that don't go away. So I cover a broad range of things. And, um, in examining Mothman, I've often wondered, well, how can we explain Mothman? This incredible wave of phenomena that happened 50 years ago, and no one still has a good explanation for exactly who Mothman, or what Mothman, is or was, and why the whole thing happened. So here today, ladies and gentlemen, are 25 explanations from the ridiculous to the probable. And don't worry, we will cover them all in an hour. We're here today because of this man, John Keel. I was a friend of John's. I knew him for many years. He uh, was a journalist by training and was very interested in the paranormal. When the Mothman wave started to hit in uh, 1966, uh, he was sent from New York down to this area to cover it, to write some stories. And he became very involved in it. And in fact, he made repeated visits to this area and um, puzzled over a lot of the phenomena, was an experiencer himself. His book, The Mothman Prophecies, which came out in the mid-1970s, <coughs> is a classic today, a runaway hit. It's still a bestseller. If you thought you were going to find out who Mothman really is from this movie that came out a few years ago, you would not. Uh, it was highly anticipated. I did like the movie. Uh, very glad to see John's work uh, put into a major film. But the movie never really grappled with the question of who or what Mothman is and why the whole thing happened. In fact, if you didn't know a lot about Mothman already, you could walk out of the theater being very puzzled as to exactly what the whole thing was about. Well, it all goes back to this place. And many of you have been out there already. I know some of you are regulars. You go out to the TNT area, the grounds where there was an abandoned munitions plant that functioned during World War II. And um, most of these structures, they're not there anymore. There are a few ruins. This is what the place looked like in the 1940s. And uh, they made a lot of munitions for uh, the war effort. A lot of these were stored in concrete igloos, which can be visited today. Most of them are empty. Uh, but uh, this is where Mothman was first seen. Now, we don't know exactly where Mothman first appeared, because Mothman might have been around in the Ohio River Valley before the first sighting in mid-November in 1966. So just a brief recap of what went on to set the stage for how we can examine explanations for Mothman today. November 15, 1966, two couples, Steve and Mary Mallett, Roger and Linda Scarberry, go out to the ruins at the TNT plant for a lark. This is where couples like to go. They like to go out to the igloos. They like to make out. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, one of those places to visit. So they're out there just having a good time. And suddenly their whole universe changes when they come up against a creature that they have never seen before. And uh, this is an early drawing 
uh, of what this winged humanoid looked like. Uh, and uh, they, they saw it, and it saw them, and of course they were incredibly frightened. Who wouldn't be when you see something six to seven feet tall, uh, humanoid, but with no real human head, and these two red eyes that when the light hit it glowed red, and it had wings. Uh, and uh, uh, who wouldn't go tearing out of the place? Well, that's exactly what they did. And uh, this was the description that I gave in Monsters of West Virginia. The creature was gray, or as Linda Scarberry described much later, flesh-colored with ashen wings. One of its wings appeared caught to be caught in a guide wire near the road, and the creature pulled at the wing with its, with its hands. Later, she thought the creature was frightened, but in the heat of the moment, it was the occupants of the car who erupted in fear and panic. While they screamed, the creature wiggled its wing free and wobbled with an odd shuffling gait into the generator plant through an open and broken door, like it had come from there. And maybe it was going back into hiding. So uh, the terrified uh, couple, and they were very young at that time, uh, they were in their car and they tore down the road back to Point Pleasant. And suddenly this creature was flying over the car. It's keeping pace with them no matter how fast they are going. This thing is keeping pace with the car. And every now and then they can hear thumping on the roof. Sounds like the <coughs> wings of this thing are beating on the roof and it's looking in the window at them. They hit speeds of 100 miles an hour. It's still keeping pace with them. Uh, and there were descriptions both of whether or uh, uh, differing as to whether or not this creature flapped its wings. And many people said that this flying thing could go through the air um, without flapping its wings and also rise straight up like a helicopter because what happens for 13 months then is this eruption of weird phenomena. There are UFO reports, uh, strange lights in the sky, craft seen in the sky, landed craft. Uh, Susan Shepard, uh, she's told you about uh, Woody uh, Derenberger and his encounters with the Indian Coop Cold, which actually preceded the sighting of 1967 when the Silver Bridge across the river collapses, went full of people. Uh, traffic is stalled on the bridge, and uh, people have been Christmas shopping and um, buying gifts and things. They're stalled on the bridge, and uh, the bridge had a structural flaw in it, and it collapsed into the river. Um, and it was a huge tragedy, which affected just about everybody in Point Pleasant. Uh, here's a, a picture of the uh, collapsed bridge. The bridge was torn down. It was replaced by another bridge a little further down uh, the river now. But when the bridge collapsed, it seemed like some sort of kinetic energy that was powering this wave came to an end. It was almost like things just got swallowed up in it. And Mothman goes away. And a lot of the UFO activity goes away. Not permanently, but just not in the intensity that people have been experiencing before. Now, this area has had a long history of hauntings, uh, strange phenomena, mysterious creatures, and UFO activities. So this is nothing new to the area. It's just that for this period of time, it was at a very unusual pitch. And of course, Mothman being a very unusual player in it, because prior to that, we, we had some uh, reports of uh, winged humanoids. Those go back in time, uh, centuries but uh, nothing quite like Mothman. And uh, people said that um, they saw Mothman by the Silver Bridge before it collapsed. Uh, they wondered if Mothman had caused the bridge to collapse because there were all these prophecies of doom and dire things happening. Uh, people were getting communications from ETs about uh, bad prophecies. Keel even got them. One of the ET prophecies that was delivered to him was that there was going to be a massive power failure on this night. And it was not a power failure, but it was the bridge collapse. So here we are then, 50 years on, still searching for explanations. Uh, Mothman became so ingrained in the media that uh, almost any winged creature anywhere in the world is instantly labeled Mothman. Is it the same as the entity that uh, uh, plague the Ohio River Valley from 66 to 67? We can't say. Are there lots of Mothman? Uh, was it one of many? We really don't know, but now Mothman has become synonymous with winged uh, figures, especially if they have kind of a human-like shape. 
but we've had no repeat of the 1966-67 wave. So what are some of the explanations that have been advanced for Mothman, and how much weight should we give them? Well, there have been a lot, and uh, uh, most people don't realize a lot of explanations have been put forward. Here I'm covering 25 of them. There probably are a lot more, but these are the ones that have been talked about and debated about. Now remember in the beginning I said they were going to go from the ridiculous to the problem. So we're going to look at some of the ridiculous ones first. I think um, some of them are, are fairly uh, safe to eliminate. Number one being the Sand Hill Crane. Now just yesterday I was out in Point Pleasant and I talked to um, a local person in a, in a shop who insisted that Mothman uh, really was mistaken for a sandhill crane. These birds stand four to six feet tall. They have about 10 feet wingspans. But how do you go from sandhill to muscular human torso uh, and ashen colored wings? In fact, Linda at one time described them as looking more furry. Other descriptions described them as kind of bat-like. Uh, maybe there were differences in perception, but how do you go from a long-necked bird with long legs to that as mistaken identity. Highly, highly unlikely. But nonetheless, this was one of the first theories put forward, and the media grabbed on it, of course. And uh, this is what experiencers have to deal with, that uh, they can be immediately debunked by skeptics by saying, oh, it was a weather balloon. Uh, what you saw in the sky was swamp gas. Uh, that went around for a while until Alan Hynek decided that swamp gas was really not a very good explanation for UFOs. But the skeptics really stretch it. Another uh, thing that we can dismiss is owls. In other words, uh, people are saying, well, it was dark, uh, owl lights can glow when uh, headlights hit them. I've never seen an owl with red eyes. Uh, but they're big birds, and uh, maybe that's what you saw. Yes, an owl that flies at 100 miles an hour and chases a car, and then looks in the windows of houses, yes. Um, I think uh, we can safely eliminate owls. Uh, there are many artistic depictions of Mothman, and uh, you know, you see them in different interpretations, and kind of an owl-like guise, that's another one. Oh, by the, na oh, by the way, where did we get the name Mothman? That was a journalist. Uh, who came up with that name almost facetiously. Uh, these were not moth wings. The creature did not have a moth body, but it facetiously was given the name Mothman, and it stuck. Thunderbirds, another explanation. Um, legendary birds that um, there have been many sightings and reports of, um, even in America, around the world, over uh, a good period of history, and some alleged carcasses, which um, never have been proved uh, to be a real thing. But uh, in other words, giant birds that fly around in the sky and have uh, huge wingspans and are very dark in color. But here again, the bird shape to a man shape, it just doesn't compute. What the witnesses, beyond the scarberries and the mallets, what they all saw was a humanoid shape, not a bird shape. Mythical birds. Um, other mythical birds besides the Thunderbirds that come out of mythology, some of them are semi-divine, some of them are gods, uh, that also have uh, large forms and wings, and um, they're very intelligent. That was another thing. This creature, Mothman, exhibited intelligence. It exhibited an awareness of uh, who was observing it, and it seemed to be curious about them. Maybe it was flying along the, the car that the uh, Scarberries and Mallets were in that night, because I wanted to know what the heck was going on. Who are these creatures? And what's going on here? But it exhibited an intelligence. And of course, we find that in mythical words. Even in the um, first uh, cover of uh, John Keel's book, The Mothman Prophecies, uh, it's related to one of these mythical words known as the Garuda from Eastern mythology, an investigation into the mysterious American visits of the infamous feathery Garuda. And yet here's this a lumbering creature on the cover that doesn't look anything like depictions of Garudas, uh, which are more birds with um, uh, man-like uh, man features on them uh, from mythology. Now, one of the things that the original witnesses noticed uh, when they first saw Mothman was that it had kind of an odd shuffling gait. There 
was something not quite normal. It didn't move like a normal creature. It didn't move like a normal man, or even like what you might associate for a bird or an animal. It had this odd kind of lumbering gait. And this is very characteristic of mysterious creatures in general, that uh, when people see uh, things that look to be like giant birds or strange creatures that are amalgams of different kinds of, of um, uh, creatures, uh, they don't move like uh, we would expect the normal creatures, i.e. beings from, from our reality, uh, pointing to maybe there's something supernatural or otherworldly going on here, that we're seeing a form that's maybe a shape-shifted form or something from another realm. But anyway, the uh, mythical uh, bird was a popular prehistoric being. Some people said, well, um, you know, it's the same sort of idea that's advanced for Loch Ness, and for Bigfoot and even Thunderbirds, that uh, these aren't really supernatural. These are beings left over from prehistoric times, and we just don't know about it. Uh, and uh, while there are new species uh, discovered all the time around the planet, and things can be very hidden, we have a lot of remote patches on this planet, uh, the idea that Mothman was some prehistoric being, that's not too likely either, uh, because uh, it doesn't have a track record with us. We have flying humanoids that are reported throughout uh, history, but nothing quite like Mothman. So if it was some prehistoric being, then it's really showing up for the first time. And then where did it go? Here's one that's really off the wall, Chief Cornstalk. And uh, I, I believe Susan talked uh, about uh, Chief Cornstalk. Uh, a bit too. And uh, the Shawnee chief who was uh, working with uh, whites in the 1700s uh, was rather betrayed by them and murdered uh, at Fort Randolph, uh, he and his son. And there was this story that went around for a long time that uh, Cornstalk had laid a curse on the land and that this curse had tainted uh, literally the ground itself and everything that happened here. And so some suggested that, well, maybe Mothman was uh, Cornstalk's curse, you know, coming back uh, finally to get people to, uh, you know, make them pay some sort of price for what was done to him. Well, the curse story really is more of a fiction. It was created for a play in the early 20th century. Cornstalk and his son were shot at point blank range. It's not likely that there was any cursing done in the final seconds of Fallen angels have been advanced uh, because Mothman was dark and scary, uh, then surely this entity must be something out of hell. And of course, uh, along with fallen angels, uh, you know, another term being demon, that maybe this was some demonic entity and uh, that some doorway to hell had opened up and this creature had gotten loose and was going to terrorize people. There are some depictions of Mothman that make it look pretty scary in a demonic sort of way. Well, Linda Scarberry said, um, out of all the phone calls, to keep evil away. So some said, well, maybe Mothman is some sort of a gargoyle figure, and it's really protecting the land. And it just suddenly got discovered. But it's it's been here a long time, and uh, you know maybe this whole area is its uh, is its province. Dark Angel, another explanation, that well maybe uh, Mothman wasn't um, a demon uh, because his behavior didn't seem to be demonic, but maybe it was like a dark angel, something with wings, a supernatural figure. Um, this explanation didn't get uh, uh, too much play because people want to polarize Mothman one way or the other. A flying humanoid. Uh, well this gets back to very old reports of uh, flying humanoids being seen all over the world. And uh, they had uh, literally more of a humanoid look than Mothman did because they had human heads and some of them had actual features. Mothman was rather distorted. Didn't really have a human-like head, but had sort of a, a, a hump uh, from shoulder, what we would call shoulder to shoulder with the eyes set more in that uh, and extremely large hands and these muscular legs and then this odd way of walking. Uh, but nonetheless, flying humanoid, uh, that gets to be, uh, well, maybe Mothman is part of that class of beings that, that we people have seen throughout the ages. Uh, we don't know who they are or why they show up, but they're seen flying about or, or uh, even interacting pe with people. And maybe Mothman is just the latest version of that. Bat human. 
That was another uh, explanation. This goes back to a hoax in the 19th century, the moon hoax. And uh, it was perpetrated through the media. There was a lot of hoax journalism during the 19th century while publications competed for uh, readership. And uh, this hoax was about how people had been seen on the moon, and the moon was inhabited, and some of them were bat people, and they had bat-like wings. And so maybe Mothman was one of them, and he actually flew down from the moon and uh, suddenly started walking around on the earth, not real likely. Uh, ghost. Uh, was uh, Mothman some sort of uh, a spirit of something deceased that uh, had taken on some weird shape? Uh, and because it um, didn't operate according to the laws of known creatures, that maybe it really was more of a ghost spirit. Well, I think this gets a little closer to uh, what Mothman probably really is, that Mothman is still around. But ghost, uh, I do not feel, is uh, one of those explanations. Ghosts usually refer to spirits of the dead, something that is dead. And Mothman just did not act like that astral beings. Was Mothman some sort of unknown entity that uh, came out of the astral realm and uh, that some sort of weird doorway had opened up and um, uh, this thing had come through? Well, that actually gets into plausible territory because uh, the astral realm is uh, a place where a lot of us have our unusual experiences and encounters. It's a formless realm that uh, is uh, material of a lot of shape-shifting, and many of these mysterious creatures and entities that we encounter, they are shape-shifters. Whether they are shape-shifters deliberately or not, or they just shape-shift according to our perceptions, it could very well be both is the case. So, yes, maybe Mothman did come from the astral realm. Others said, well, Mothman's really a mutant creature. You know, they first saw it out there at the TNT plant, and the ground there is contaminated, the water's contaminated. So what if all those chemicals generated by the TNT plant cr somehow created some monstrous mutant creature? And maybe it started out uh, to be a real creature that uh, mutated over time, and there might, have, might be other mutant creatures. Well, we have the bat squash, another mutant creature. And uh, yes, my friend Eric Altman reminded me of the bat squash. Um, and uh, this is, uh, well, I don't know what it is, <laughs> but uh, it's a rather ferocious looking. You know, here we have a humanoid uh, kind of uh, appearance with these big muscular thighs, kind of a, an animal or demonic like head and these wings. And um, Bat Squatch uh, has been seen in some mountainous areas, a lot of the sightings, for example. Uh, it's been seen around Mount Shasta, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens. Uh, has been seen flying in the sky. Uh, here's from a sighting at Mount Shasta in 2009. Me and my friend were hiking around Mount Shasta, and out of one of the crevices flew out this big creature. I mean, this thing was huge. It was as tall as a man, as stocky as Hulk Hogan and had leathery wings. I believe the wingspan was at least 50 feet from one end to the other. Well, sometimes it's hard to gauge wingspan when, when you see something for a very short period of time, so who knows. However, uh, there is a theory that bat squash originated, or at least um, maybe spawned, um, from uh, eruptions like Mount St. Helens, which blew its top off in 1980 and uh, about a third of the mountain slid down the mountainside uh, into a lake, and uh, it's still an active volcano. Mount St. Helens is in southwestern Washington state. And in fact, my husband Joe and I were just there this summer. Um, there's now a viewing area that you can go to on the blown out side uh, to look at the remains of the crater and a dome that's building there. And uh, the lake that all of this debris took from the explosion uh, raised 200 feet, it raised the level of the lake 200 feet, and there was a village there that people, uh, you, there were cabins, people camped, and uh, for hiking and fishing were not all covered, all gone. So was there something from this enormous uh, eruption that uh, opened up a doorway or created something for bat squash, uh, and could something similar have happened in uh, Point Pleasant? Thought form. And now this is an idea that uh, 
these creatures are really created by us. That the coalescing of human thought and belief then takes on an active form. It actually becomes something. And uh, this is very well known in magic, for example, that uh, you can magically create thought forms and task them with things. They have to be continually energized, however, in order to have any lasting. But thought forms of all kinds can be created. And uh, so one theory is that, well, maybe Mothman was um, an accidental thought form. That there was something going on at the time that uh, this being then was created from collective thought and belief of a large number of people. And uh, here again, pointing back to a contaminated area in TNT, that maybe there was a combination of things that generated a Mothman. And uh, because Mothman became then uh, a permanent fixture in folklore and media and in experience, and in people uh, thinking about it, talking about it, here we are, thousands of people today talking about Mo Mothman, <coughs> that this generates the psychic energy that would keep a thought form alive. But could it generate other thought forms? Could it generate other Mothmans? Well, there's some plausibility there. Magic gone wrong. Uh, this is an adjunct to the thought form idea that maybe Mothman was uh, the outgrowth of uh, somebody's bad magic. That uh, they were attempting to uh, create uh, something else and uh, blew it, uh, didn't do the magic right, and Mothman was the result and went amok off on its own and uh, gained its own independence. Well, in the literature, there is some precedent for this sort of thing, and uh, we can find it in Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, where there's a thought form called the tulpa, which is a duplicate of a human being that can be created through magic. And uh, when you create something like this magically, you have to do it with complete control over it because if it's energized enough, it starts to take on its own identity and its own control. And uh, there was a British woman named Alexandra David Neal who uh, did a lot of exploring in Tibet in the uh, early 20th century. And she wrote about an experience that she had where she created a tulpa to be a companion on the journey. And it gained its own personality and its own power. And it started getting very nasty and got darker and darker uh, as it got more and more of its own power. And she had to go through a very elaborate ritual then to dissolve this being. Well, magic gone wrong, probably not a real likely explanation. Grim Reaper, Harbinger of Death and Doom. Uh, it really became fixated in popular culture that Mothman had something to do with death and doom because of the collapse of the Silver Bridge. And people say, I saw that thing uh, near the bridge or on the bridge, right before it collapsed, and it must have had something to do with it. What well, we now have since then, rashes of uh, sometimes post-armchair uh, quarterbacking, uh, whenever there is a big disaster around the world, uh, that people look for sightings of Mothman. Was there a winged humanoid seen in the area right before something really bad happened? And uh, so then we do have these, uh, these reports. So is Mothman something then that shows up when uh, there's going to be a cataclysmic event for people like some dark gray reaper? Many people do believe this. Time traveler. Another idea, Mothman isn't from now, Mothman is from the future. And this is what maybe what people are going to look like in the future, or some unknown species that's going to develop in the future. And uh, there was some warp in the uh, dimensional fabric of time and space that Mothman got caught up in, along with this wave of activity, and uh, really visited us from the future. Um, I don't think this is too likely, but you know, a lot of these things, you can't just write them off wholesale uh, because we just simply don't know how a lot of these things operate. Um, is Mothman an extraterrestrial? Well, because of all the activity with the UFOs and the landed craft and uh, other sorts of UFO-related uh, phenomena, many people felt that Mothman was some sort of weird ET. And uh, if you followed ufology and the contact experiences that people have had, they're not all the little gray guys. That, that was a, a model that became a stereotype standard uh, around the 1980s on. But prior to the 1980s, people described all kinds of appearances for aliens that they encountered. And uh, this rep representation is of a reptilian alien, a draconian reptilian. Many people believe in reptilian aliens and have encounters with them. 
and sometimes these beings are uh, seen and shown with wings. So was Mothman really, I mean, did he come, uh, arrive maybe on one of these ships? And uh, he was really an alien, and maybe the ship went off without him, and he wandered around for a while until they picked him up. Was he a UFO himself? Um, now, we've had reports in modern times of man-shaped UFOs. And uh, here's uh, one example from Los Angeles. They're calling it the Michelin astronaut, uh, because these things are kind of puffy white, and they look like, um, you've probably seen photographs of um, men figures with uh, jet packs on their back and then rise up in, into uh, the air a bit. Uh, well, uh, there have been reports that some UFOs look like this, but they're not dark with red eyes and looking like they're covered in uh, fur or, or feathers or uh, anything else that we would associate with wings. They really do look more like uh, Michelin men. So I think we can rule out that uh, Mothman was a UFO, but you know, maybe there was some association with UFOs and ETs. Men in Black. Uh, the Men in Black come along with a lot of UFO waves, and they are uh, humanoids. Uh, they're not people, but um, they're humanoids, and Susan Shepard has talked a lot about her experiences with uh, Men in Black um, uh, in this area. and. Um, uh, they often harass witnesses. Uh, they seem to know who people are, where they live. They know a lot of personal information. They uh, walk in very odd gates, just like the mysterious creatures. There's something really strange about their appearance. Uh, and they tell people, you better not talk about what you saw, or bad things will happen. And uh, many cases like that, Men in Black, are still documented today. Uh, they're not the big joke like the movie, but uh, they can be very serious business for people who encounter them. So was Mothman related to them? Maybe a shape-shifted form of men in black. Well, Mothman certainly came along with this wave of activity that did involve men in black. And um, whether or not this creature intended to, it did terrify people, but it didn't terrify them into silence. This is one of my theories, the djinn. Uh, the jinn are a supernatural race of beings that um, share the planet with us, but from another dimension. They're uh, master shapeshifters, and when they interact with people, they like to take weird forms. One of their favorites is the shadow person, which looks like a tall man with a hat. I think there's a relationship there to the men in black. And uh, they will often take dark forms, spectral forms that have red eyes, black dogs with red eyes, uh, snakes with red eyes, there's the reptilian connection, shadowy uh, monstrous figures with red eyes, uh, and they, a lot of them seem to like to mess around with us. So could Mothman have been a djinn that decided that it was um, going to go on an entertainment binge uh, and uh, take advantage of some circumstances and terrify people? Well, that's uh, a possibility. But here's the explanation that Keel favored, and I favor it too that regardless of what label you want to put on it, um, Mothman is an unknown. And John Keel coined this term, ultra-terrestrial, to refer to unknown beings from essentially another dimension. And uh, that uh, we may not ever know exactly who or what they are. This uh, drawing, by the way, is uh, from a sighting in, uh, around Butler in uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, I did interview the witness of this. This is a, a being that um, uh, was seen crossing the road and seen by uh, a number of witnesses has a human-like shape. So you can see there's something distorted about the head and whatever is on the back, uh, it was unclear whether it was wings or a cape or something hard, but that's what it looked like. So a Mothman-like figure. And Keel said that, uh, uh, he called it in one of his books, a phantasmagoria, that we may just live in a universe that's like a phantasmagoria. And every time we go chasing the, the phenomenon, with a capital P, whatever it is, uh, we try to find a meaning to it and an explanation. And the closer we get to an explanation, the further away it gets from us, or it just blows up on us like an exploding cigar. Uh, and that there's something out there in the cosmos, like a, a, a archetypal trickster, that just wants to mess around with us. And so maybe Mothman, was an ultra-terrestrial. Well, that definition fits Mothman the best uh, because uh, no matter what explanation you consider, 
Mothman is still a mystery, still an unknown. Yes, it could be this, it could be uh, combinations of some of these explanations that have been put forward. We simply don't know. But I, I have always favored the idea myself that the Earth sits in a reality of stacked parallel realities. And this comes, uh, this is bolstered now in concepts of quantum physics, that uh, our reality is one of many that are really tied to the Earth. And these other realities are, are like other worlds, just like ours, other dimensions, that vibrate at their own rate, and we don't interact with them. Uh, there could be realities where um, duplicates of ourselves are having nearly the same lives, but not quite the same lives. And uh, the, uh, the TV show Fringe, if you watched that, dealt with this concept where there was another uh, Earth uh, that did not have the technology that we have, where 9-11 never happened, and yet there were intersections where these uh, uh, dimensional worlds were colliding. So an ultra-terrestrial could come from one of these parallel realities. And it was Kiel's opinion that for unknown reasons, if circumstances were right, a window between realities would fly open and this would enable access. Now, this seems to be a very strange kind of access because um, we don't seem to have uh, the ability to go through these windows and come back. Uh, I do suspect, however, that many of our missing persons cases might be people who accidentally fall into an interdimensional window and they cannot get back. Um, but uh, other entities come through these windows and they seem to have the ability to get back. And I think that's one explanation for why we never find good trace evidence, we don't find bodies, uh, we have... Uh, uh, a sighting of something wobbling down the road in front of us and then boom, it's gone in the blink of an eye. Where did it go? Uh, and uh, a lot of these entities uh, act just as startled as we do when they see us. So uh, maybe they're having the same sort of bad day that we are uh, when we have uh, experiences with them. But anyway, did this window come open in the Mid-Ohio River Valley in 1966? As I mentioned earlier, there's been a long history of paranormal activity here, so maybe this area is kind of open anyway. But what could be the possible circumstances that a big window would come open? Because this, this whole area was full of phenomena for 13 months. It was just all over the place. It was madness. Um, now remember what I said in the beginning about the Mothman wave. There's Mothman, UFOs, ETs, men in black, weird phenomena, there'll be poltergeist things. And then this wind-up of energy, this psychic energy, where people are getting uh, more and more involved, and there's more sightings, and people are talking about it more. Uh, this wind-up of a tremendous energy that then, boom, disappears when we have this tragedy. And uh, I still, uh, personally, I still do not uh, know exactly what the relationship of the bridge collapse is to this windup of energy, but uh, I do believe that there is some relationship to it. Well, 1966 was called the year of the saucers, and uh, there were uh, an incredible number of sightings all over the world, including America. It was like uh, UFOs finally landed on the media uh, uh, radar, and people were talking about it, uh, respectable um, media outlets were reporting on it, there were uh, space brothers flying around that were having contact with people who were warning us about catastrophes and uh, impending doom on the earth, uh, there were uh, conspiracy theories about how governments are covering it up. <laughs> Uh, people were having all sorts of strange encounters. 1966, the year of the saucers. And it, Linda Scarberry at one point said that um, Mothman was sent to divert us from all of this other UFO activity. By whom? Who knows? How did that, did Mothman volunteer? Uh, was he assigned? And who would be the Oz behind the curtain doing this? We have no answers. But she saw a connection between all of the UFO activity and the appearance of Mothman. And divert attention, Mothman did. Because there was all this stuff going on in the sky, craft coming down, people having contact. 
and yet Mothman was grabbing a lot of the headlines. So maybe there is some sort of relationship there. Maybe Mothman really was the accidental tourist, a being from another realm that got pulled through an interdimensional window and could not get back. Remember what she said early on about the creature seemed frightened, had its wing caught in a wire, uh, seemed to be lost, uh, and it exhibited a curiosity about people. It, it seemed to wander around, like, what am I doing here? I'm suddenly in Ozland with all these strange beings, and how do I get back home? Uh, now, did Mothman find its way back home? Or is it one of these beings that periodically visits us through an open doorway? Is there more than one Mothman? Well, if Mothman is an entity in its own reality, tied right here to the Earth, then we would have to assume that there are others like it. And uh, I think that this explanation really fits the best for all of the characteristics of what went on, especially in that way, and especially in uh, the kinds of experiences that people report today. Just a couple of things. I, this is uh, coming to the end of my talk, and I have um, a few minutes left for questions. Um, I am an editor of Fate Magazine, and we have um, a Mothman issue that I have a very few, a little commercial here, very few copies left. I have them at my table. I also talk about Mothman and monsters in West Virginia. Uh, I did another West Virginia uh, related book called uh, West Virginia Ghost Stories. And uh, that concludes my overview of um, possible explanations for Mothman and also what I think is the most likely. A visitor from another dimension, probably tied uh, right here on Earth, but connected to a lot of other phenomena that um, uh, seem to come from other worlds. And I do believe that we are in this transformation of consciousness. And, um, Joe had mentioned when he introduced me that I'm on the uh, board of directors for the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters. And one of the things that we are examining, having completed the world's largest ever global survey of experiencers, and not just ETs, actually the term ET does not incorporate uh, everything that people report, because we do, we do have Bigfoot and creatures and ghosts and energy beings and angels. Uh, in the mix there in terms of something not from this reality that people encounter. But where this all seems to be going is a transformation of human consciousness. And that maybe when we encounter uh, these craft in the sky, these beings who seem to be from other realms, even other worlds off planet, and I think a lot of them are actually from here, just another dimension, but uh, this does cause us to, to uh, reevaluate our reality and our place in it, and that there are other things that uh, share reality with us, we just don't interact with it very often. But if uh, we have a thought form energy that keeps expanding consciousness, uh, and when we all gather in places like this to talk about it, we are creating a thought form of energy that's very malleable in terms of how, uh, how are we looking at this? then that does encourage transformation of human consciousness on a collective level. So maybe Mothman really was a prophet, all right, but a prophet of emerging uh, higher level consciousness of humanity. Not a prophet of doom, but a prophet of something else, and ushering, uh, helping to usher us in to a different age of an expanded <laughs> awareness. I do believe that in the future our planet is going to be populated quite regularly, our reality, with all kinds of beings. Because they've been here all along, we just don't encounter them very often. We treat them as oddball cases. But what if they became part of our extended reality? So uh, I think that that demonstrates the depth of what's going on here. The Mothman isn't just some weird phenomena happened to a bunch of people 50 years ago and still happens to people today, uh, Mothman has something to say to us all about uh, the nature of our consciousness and, and uh, what we are encountering and experiencing and how we're dealing with it. Are we passing it off as a joke? We, we ran the devil out of the church, so that's what you saw. You were drunk, of course. It was a balloon. It was a, a bird. 
instead of dealing with it in terms of going to the heart of it, what it is and what it means to individuals and, uh, and to us collectively. So a lot of food for thought here. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. I thank you very much. And I've got just a couple of times, uh, minutes for questions. Thank you. What is the significance of a person born with a call? A call is the amniotic fluid that clings to the head. And in birth, it usually falls off. But in, in uh, some people, they're actually born with this membrane still covering the head. And in folklore around the world, it is believed that persons who are born with a call possess the ability to see the unseen, that they have special psychic and spiritual powers. And depending on the culture, they might have what we would call witch powers. They can converse with the supernatural. They know how to heal. They know how to spell cast. Uh, they see the spirit realms. And uh, even vampires uh, in the uh, uh, vampire folklore, uh, there are uh, even beliefs that if you're born with a call and you don't take special care for the child, that the child, because of its affinity with the spirit world, is in danger of becoming a vampire after death. And sometimes the call is taken off and it's dried and desiccated, and then they wear it like an amulet uh, around the neck. So, yes, it is a, extremely psychic. Uh, the second question was a wraith seen in uh, library stacks uh, by a priest in, uh, discerned. Uh, a wraith is uh, a general description for a ghost or a spirit. Uh, there could be many reasons why something is there. It could be a residual, something left over from uh, the land, from activity uh, in the church. Um, and uh, without a bigger context, it would be harder to, uh, to make a... a an analysis of it, but I will say this, a lot of our religious officials, regardless of what religion they hail from, uh, are often the first person to pull the plug on us when we go to them for explanations about our paranormal and supernatural encounters. And that patently is just, uh, just wrong. It should be the other way around. They should be some of the first people to help us because uh, people often fall back on their faith when they're trying to, to uh, explain these things. But um, uh, sometimes they're just very unsettled by it. But uh, churches, um, my experience of churches in general is that because of all the emotions that go on there and you're dealing with people in the pitch of emotions, they're in exultation and happiness, they're in the depths of sorrow and grief and they need comfort. All of those uh, intense energies can just leave layers and layers that uh, can uh, attract spirits or even uh, cause thought form like spirits. So I think we're at time. <coughs> oh, five minutes, okay. <coughs> so I can take uh, maybe one or two more quick questions. Well, I guess I left everybody speechless. <laughs> All right. Okay. I was wanting to know what your ideas on sleep paralysis are and alternate realities and what you do about that. My ideas on sleep paralysis. <coughs> Many of our experiences are nighttime experiences, uh, visitations, abductions, and people will describe being paralyzed. We do go through natural sleep paralysis every night <coughs> where the um, motor functions of the body are quieted. It's my personal belief <coughs> that a lot of entities take advantage of this and that they know what those stages are uh, and we're vulnerable when we sleep anyway for a lot of these things and uh, if you were an entity that wanted to have a visitation with a certain impact especially fear the gender very good at this the shadow people 
<coughs> the aliens who abduct us are very good at that. You would like to go when that person was in a state of paralysis. <coughs> and I also think that they can exacerbate that paralysis and they can also put us into states of paralysis. Many people talk about the mesmerizing factor when they become conscious of these entities, like these uh, beings are putting them into some sort of a trance where they have lost their power of volition. So it could be a combination of things. And uh, there is a whole subset of this, the night terrors, that often occurs during uh, sleep paralysis as well. Now, not every nightmare, uh, not every uh, night terror is going to have a supernatural cause, and I do believe in looking for natural causes first. Uh, some of them may be psychological uh, in nature. So um, sleep paralysis is bound up, I think, in these, these paranormal episodes. Okay, one more question and then uh, two minutes. Okay, so one quick question. but uh, there's quite a range of tools that fairies and other beings have for uh, seeing the spirit world or the power of invisibility. And in werewolf lore, we find the magical belt that the person dons to uh, transform into something else. And the fairies uh, supposedly have this salve that uh, puts on the eye, that put on the eyes, that enables the windows or the doors of perception to come open. Whether or not it's an actual salve or it is some shift in consciousness that um, is portrayed as that uh, is unknown, but it's quite prominent in, in fairy lore. And the fairies will also blind people, too. If you, um, they don't like what you do, then uh, they will strike you blind. They won't just give you parasite. They will literally strike you blind. So I think I uh, best close. And thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.